Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, as mentioned, uh, explore the, you know, the first steps for uh, firewall automation uh, as we see it here in Tufin. Uh, as part of the agenda, we're going to discuss the uh, challenges uh, enterprise uh, posing in the network security uh, world. Uh, we'll show a, a specific business case, uh, we call it the crime and the punishment, uh, where uh, uh, automation can shame in and really help uh, um, fixing some uh, uh, stuff that were done manually. We're going to have a pool, uh, hear your voice and understand where are you situated with uh, the current uh, automation. Uh, and then we're going to discuss uh, three uh, main use cases uh, for automation and discuss with the different approaches and how you do it today uh, the traditional way, how you know, uh, we see it happening uh, in our customers and, and uh, in the industry, and how you can do it uh, in a bit different way uh, with Tiffin. Hopefully, it will help you to, uh, uh, to better understand uh, the value that could be uh, uh, gained with uh, management, uh, with security management concepts like Tiffin. Lastly, we'll have the summary, and then we'll have a short session for Q&A. So we'll start with the enterprise network security challenges. And you know, most, if not all, the enterprises today uh, face a number of serious network security challenges. Uh, the top two, without, you know, without a doubt, is uh, complexity and change. Uh, what causes this network complexity? You can say that you know, today uh, we have a next-gen networks or hybrid IT. These terms uh, all mean the same thing. <clears throat> a highly complex, heterogeneous environment of multi-device, multi-vendor, multi-platform, and sometimes even multi-cloud technologies. Now, the change uh, portion of it, you know, enterprises must also deal with the ever-changing security policies with waves of change requests for across the enterprise's diverse environment. Uh, and as such, uh, you know, cope with violating uh, with volatile sorry, situations that can easily introduce new attack vectors and increase <coughs> vulnerability to cyber threats. Now, you can also see how the increasing chaos uh, caused by today's network complexity and rapid pace of change directly contributes to the third challenge. Uh, uh, you can see here the cybersecurity. Uh, every day we hear about the alarming rising tide of breaches and you know, hack attempts throughout the world. So uh, you know, we know that cyber attacks will happen and threats must be contained. It's only a matter of time of when the next breach will, will happen and you must you know, get prepared and be able to contain the threat uh, as part of your uh, network uh, activities. Uh, another, another item is uh, the connectivity. Uh, application and user connectivity obviously is always a major focus, uh, whether it's a large-scale project like uh, data center migration or moving workloads uh, to the cloud and, you know, or adding new users. Making sure the business is always connected is maybe you know, most of the crucial part of any organization. Uh, last but certainly not least is the compliance piece where all enterprises in the world must enforce a certain uh, level of compliance, whether it's you know, industrial compliance or uh, uh, you know, internal regulations that uh, the organization uh, dictates. And you know, when saying compliance, we mean not just being compliance at the time of the audit, but being continuously compliance, coping with the rapid change of network connectivity and application requirements. So in order to get you know, on top of these five serious challenges, you must have an organization, you know, an organization must have a solution that stays in the middle and gives you a single console uh, or single pane of glass to orchestrate security policies across your different network areas, whether it's physical or hybrid uh, uh, cloud. Now, <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about uh, automation. Automation system brings a great deal of value. Um, having the ability to produce better, faster, and you know, more reliable results can go a long way in improving business agility and simplifying the day-to-day -day tasks. 
this is true for any type of automation system, but especially when leveraging the power of automation in order to secure and manage information technology. Uh, there are three major areas which automation shames in and can dramatically give you a serious you know, boost uh, to your results and execution plan. Um, the first one is, is when network change is required. You know, things can get significantly more complex and out of control when managing them manually across heterogeneous environment. You know, as mentioned before, that may include multi-vendor, multi-technology platform, physical network, or you know, even hybrid cloud. Now, combine network complexity with the fast pace of change and the potential chaos is pretty obvious. Um, so automation simply helps to cope with the complexity and the agility uh, using different algorithms and mechanisms that you can, you know, will demonstrate uh, soon as part of this presentation. And, you know, these, these algorithms and mechanisms and, and workflows can very much contain the complexity and help you to become more agile in your processes. On top of that, the system will assure that the compliance is not broken, is not broken, sorry, and you know uh, will help you to get continuous compliance as part of any change process. The second one is obvious, you know, the obvious staffing limits and you know the challenge of recruiting more security professionals. Automation is a key when facing staffing limits, both in terms of efficiency, uh, to the fact that you want to optimize your human resources and have them focus on the comparative advantage of you know, human, which is dealing with the exception, while leave all the routine and ordinary tasks for the automated environment. Uh, it's obvious turn uh, the organization to be much more scalable to accommodate and cope with the ever-growing change uh, requirements when using automation for that matter. Ideally, um, you will want to use automation in order to allocate your staff uh, to focus on more on innovation and procedures who will you know, eventually improve your day-to-day -day, uh, operations while keeping the fire drills and the boring stuff uh, to automation to, 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 to help you to execute. Uh, last but not least, uh, in addition to product, you know, productivity gains and you know, better agility, Security automation can help to tighten an organization's security posture and to ensure continuous compliance with internal policies and industry regu regulations. As said before, combine the network complexity with the fast pace of change and the potential of human, re human error and misconfiguration, and you're on the fast lane to chaos. So for complete control and auditability, don't just look for the automation, but rather to look for the policy-based automation that has the built-in security and processes control. Um, so again, automation can help you tremendously uh, in some key areas such as the ever-growing change need, staffing limits, and cybersecurity. But let's take a simple use case and you know, test this paradigm uh, when looking to optimize your firewalls and you know, clean it up. Um, most firewalls and network teams had rules and objects to firewall policies, but removing these rules and you know, removing these objects that are no longer in use is usually a challenge. Over the years, policy gets more and more complex, complex and the people who know uh, uh, what each rule is, is doing may, long, may no longer be with the organization. Or you know, if, if you do it manually, they can simply forget or not remember because the rule was added or the group or the object was added years ago. So, and, and the risk of not doing it obviously you know, resides with compliance, compliance penalties and security breaches that caused by such misconfiguration, uh, mismanagement, and you know, at the end of the day, it all comes to the same thing of mistakes. So if you think about it, with standardized routine of firewall cleanup automation, you will be able to achieve this, this process. The process is also useful for organizations that prepare legacy firewalls root set uh, and you know, uh, to have them converted into next-gen firewall platforms 
uh, with the overall goal of achieving policy compliance. So, you know, this is why uh, you want to do it, why you want to achieve uh, automation with your firewalls. And, you know, the obvious uh, uh, thing of why not doing it, you know, identifying the rules and the objects that can, re that can be removed and are not critical uh, for the connectivity requires some thorough analysis and various approvals. This is a bandwidth that usually do not exist for uh, the security professionals who are supposed to do it. So enabling an easy tools uh, for automating such activities will you know, tremendously help you and the organization to complete these tasks, uh, and this is what we're going to see uh, very soon. So at this stage, um, we can have a poll um, about uh, uh, how often you attend your firewall cleanup. So the question is, how often do you clean up your firewalls? The first answer is every quarter, as the regulation you know, requires and dictates me. The second uh, answer will be twice a year, like a clock. C will be once a year, when I have the time. And D, how often do I do what? Uh, for those of you who never or you know, didn't intend the firewall cleanup uh, uh, project uh, since. So let's take a minute to, to have your votes. Okay, open up the voting. Let's get started. All right, we got the results coming in now. Okay. Keep growing, keep growing. You can continue to, to hit the button. Okay, we have a tie. Uh, let's give it uh, 30 more seconds to have everybody to to vote. Come on, we have more than 60 votes. Go ahead. Yeah, and I'm hoping that A wins out, but uh, so far. <laughs> Yeah, a, a, a and C are the are in match to 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 win the race, but I see that D is you no know, completing the gap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess a lot of people out there don't like spaghetti. Huh? <laughs> okay, uh, so ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, and off we go. So let's review the results. Uh, Joe, you want to you see them? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it looks like C is the winner at uh, once a year, and uh, the big loser is twice a year. And then uh, every quarter and I don't do it at all are actually – uh, tied for for second place there, so uh, very surprising, right? We we expect to see uh, people, you know, pruning their firewall rules all the time. Uh, but maybe if we show them how easy it is to do with Tufin, uh, we can skew the the poll for the next time. Yeah, what concerns me the most is that uh, option number four has 25 percent of of the vote, means that one of each four people actually don't clean up his firewall. And uh, we just talked about the challenges. Obviously, the challenges uh, um, you know, contribute to that fact, to that sad fact. Uh, and let's, you know, let's get going and speak about different use cases that we can help you with uh, to improve these statistics. So, Joe, on to you. All right. So, so the first one would be rule decommissioning or the, the act of removing or disabling a rule. And... You know, on uh, first glance, you think, oh, this is the easiest thing that you could do, right? You just go into the firewall, find the rule, turn it off, and uh, move on. But uh, as mentioned, it is actually uh, a very difficult and uh, uh, risky move to actually do rule decommissioning. And 
And actually, there's a lot of labor involved in tracking down and, and doing the analysis. So the first thing is that we have to figure out um, not only, you know, the access given for a rule for a particular firewall, but where is that access along the network path, right? So we have to figure out uh, what other devices are allowing this access. Uh, maybe it's across multiple sites and so on. Um, tracking that down is going to be difficult. And then what's really interesting is the removal itself because of the nature of firewalls. And so firewalls are generally a, a first match policy. That is the first rule that matches your traffic flow. Uh, that rule will act upon it. Now, if you go and remove uh, a rule from the firewall, that traffic flow will continue down your policy set until it's matched. Um, you know, hopefully it's hitting probably the, the last rule, your, your implicit deny rule. But if not, you may be potentially allowing traffic to go where it wasn't intended. And that can open you up to compliance problems and so on. And then you also have this idea that other things could be using this rule that, that you don't know about, right? So you're hoping that, you know, you're going to turn off an access for a given, uh, a given subnet or something like that. But then, you know, something else in that subnet uh, is, is needing to get out that you didn't know about. Um, and as soon as you turn off that rule, uh, you're, you may get a phone call from the service owner. So let's take a look at how you would do this the normal way or, or as the way without TUFIN, right? So if we add up, you know, generally most folks uh, are going to have more than one firewall. Um, they may or may not have a management platform for that firewall, something like uh, Panorama or Forda Manager. And then uh, you may have multiple firewalls on top of that from different vendors. So the first thing you know, someone is going to have to do is actually log into all these management consoles. Uh, and depending on your authentication scheme, uh, you know, that could take several minutes and so forth just to get uh, the console loaded. And then we talked about you know, figuring out which devices are actually responsible for this access. That takes a, a great deal of, uh, of time as well. And some vendor products are going to make it easier for you to search for rules. Uh, some are not. And then additionally, once you start finding out this information, where are you keeping track of it? Right? Are you um, using Notepad? Uh, you have an Excel spreadsheet or something. Um, you know, doing this uh, kind of ad hoc, again, opens you up to mistakes. And then we talked about earlier, the earlier slide about the rule analysis or the, the policy analysis that you have to do once this rule is removed. Um, and that, you know, there generally isn't a function in a, in a vendor console for you to do something like that, right? A, a traffic simulator type approach. And so you have to do this all in your head, uh, classic kind of stare and compare with policies. And when you add all of that labor activity up, um, what you're left with is really kind of a loss of productivity, right? where automation can be uh, saving you time for other tasks. And, and, and if you prefer to procrastinate, you could use that time to actually enjoy your coffee in the morning instead. OK, so uh, let's explore the other way around and you know how you could achieve this with uh, Tiffin. And it's uh, demo time, so let's move uh, to our uh, management console. So uh, this is Tiffin uh, for anyone who that you know too thin. Uh, we have two systems up and running currently. Uh, the first one is Secure Track, uh, our way to demonstrate all the rules, uh, object cleanup risks, and etc. Uh, for your benefit. And today we're going, as Joe mentioned, uh, going to explore uh, you know, a single use case, which is the rule decommissioning. Um, so too thin, too thin lets you a true single pane of glass into your entire policy base. Uh, being true vendor agnostic, uh, both for physical and hybrid cloud. Using the Tufin policy browser, as you can see here, um, you can easily search for rules based on various amounts of criteria, narrowing down to the actual rules which you were looking for. Uh, so when it came up in, you know, in, in mind, you would definitely want to have access for such a tool that consolidates all the information you need uh, for deciding whether a rule is needed uh, or not. So, and, and, and you can see that, uh, you know, per our experience, many users who just installed Chiefin are very quickly being overwhelmed with, you know, thousands of rules issues that need to be addressed. 
So let's explore some good starting points uh, to begin your rule cleanup project uh, using Tufin from the identification point of the rules to you automatically disabling them or removing them directly from your different firewalls. So let's start with the technical mistakes, uh, which are obviously the shadowed and redundant rules. So as mentioned, this is a single, true single pane of glass, uh, which allows you access and visibility into your entire next or network base. No matter it's containing cloud, no matter if it's containing different kinds of cloud, as you can see here, we, the, we have the AWS and Azure, but also physical devices like the Checkpoint R80. Uh, we have you know, our environment contains Cisco Assad, 40 managers, Palo Altos, and so forth, StoneSoft, NS6, and so forth. Uh, using Tufing, you have a really true single plan of glass to all of them. You don't need to access to each and every one of them everything being aggregated into the policy browsers that you see here. Now, our main interest, as I mentioned, is looking for the shadowed rules. So I want to look for, I can look for my entire policy base to all of my devices for shadowed rules. So you know, using a very easy query, which is shadowed, I want to see true and hit the search button, I immediately get all the rules within all of my firewalls, which are shadowed. Uh, for those of you not completely familiar with shadowed, uh, a fully shadowed and redundant rule is completely shadowed by, uh, is a rule that, you know, redundant and completely shadowed by another rule uh, on, on top of it. Uh, it's part of the rule base. And as, as such, the redundant rule will never be hit by any traffic connection and removing this rule will clean up your policy and make it more efficient and clearer. So here we were searching for uh, shadowed rules, and uh, obviously uh, we can start a certain operation from here, choosing a specific rule uh, and make it either disabled or remove it. Um, another you know, use case, and of course we'll show you immediately how you can remove it from TFIN, uh, using TFIN, but another use case is the business-related issues with URLs which are there but unused or never used. Uh, so it's another, you know, interesting and very easy query that you can do using TFIN, again, to your entire network, entire uh, uh, vendors in your network. So I'm looking for rules which are the last hit of them is greater than you can, you know, you have a, a template to choose whether yesterday, last week, last month, or you can simply choose know, last year and put in the days that you want to, to search upon. So here I get uh, four firewalls, four uh, areas that have rules that never been hit in the last year. This particular example is a CMA of uh, Checkpoint R80 uh, with rules, only the rules that were never hit in the last year. Now uh, let's you know, just forward for the sake of, of, uh, of the drill that we're doing, let's pick up two rules and decide that we want to disable them. So using QFIN, you can simply choose these two rules, add them into a ticket, and move away to the target, to the cart uh, review, seeing these two rules that you were wanted to, 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 to remove. Uh, um, no, another very important thing that you, I have to mention, Using this policy browser, uh, you see all the rules, but you see all the metadata on these rules. For instance, uh, these two rules that I picked up, I can see you know, uh, how it looks like in the CMA, in the check on already, but also all the metadata information that Tufin provides to you. Like here, we can see the permissiveness level of the rules, uh, low, medium, or high. Uh, it, it depends on the... Uh, uh, level of exposure uh, that each rule has. For instance, a uh, low permissiveness, permissiveness will be a rule that contains one host in the source, one host in the destination, and you know, one service allowed. Uh, and you no know, highly permissive rules will be any, any, both in the source and the destination, and multiple uh, services uh, are allowed. And you also see any violations that, have, that this rule is, is, is posing. Uh, Again, based on the security validations that being defined in TFIN, using our unified security policy, you can set your different areas where you allow or disallow 
are allowing exception between two of your security zones and you know any rule that violates these uh, 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 regulations that you set uh, beforehand in TUFIN will be shown here with a violation on it. Uh, last hit is when was the last hit that was the last time that this rule was hidden because we searched for the last year uh, we see only rules that never hit uh, on this year on and beyond uh, when it was modified whether it's shattered or not uh, who is the technical owner of the rule uh, what, what ticket was actually creating this rule who is the business owner when it's expiration date uh, who, which application is using this uh, rule, and so forth. So lots of metadata is being gathered as part of this policy browser. And what we did uh, just before uh, 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 this screen is added two rules for decommissioning. So moving on to the cart, uh, we see these two rules that we chose to decommission. Uh, we can choose the action that we want to deploy on them, whether to remove the rule or disable the rule. Uh, let's pick up disable for uh, for a start because um, you know you want to make sure before you remove a, or completely remove a rule you want to disable it uh, in case you know something happens. You can call a ticket by its name. My let's call it cleanup project 32, and you know choose the designated workflow that we created beforehand to handle this decommission of rule. When you hit continue and go to our change system, which is secure change, you can see the ticket that we were just opening waiting to be handled by the work by the designated workflow that we defined for uh, decommissioning. Now if you go to the workflow that we have defined for that particular action of decommissioning and look at it, well, we just defined a simple uh, a workflow containing three major steps. First one is to open a request for uh, remove or disable a rule. Second one is the business approval uh, for removing or disabling the rule. And third one is the technical design and the implementation. We will show you how you can you know, immediately disable or remove the rule directly from Tufin without the need to log into your device and do it uh, uh, um, you know, manually. So let's get back to the ticket itself, to the request uh, that I've just opened to remove uh, these two rules. Uh, we have the name of the subject. Uh, we set priority. Let's put it as critical. You can add attachment. Again, uh, this is the workflow that, that, that we build. When using TFIN, you can customize your workflow to your organizational needs. So one customer would want to have attachments. One other customer would want to have business justification, but also technical justification as part of the request. Third one would, you know, uh, uh, want some other stuff to add to the workflow. Everything is highly customizable using TUFIN, and this is a great value because you can fit your workflow to your specific organization. So I choose critical. I want to disable these rules. The business justification is that these rules were never hit. And let's hit submit. For the sake of demonstration, we will be also the handlers of the tickets. Obviously, in, in real life, the handlers and the requesters are not always the same. So we'll, let's go for tasks and see that Henry Care, which is the user that I'm logging with, has a new uh, ticket waiting for him, which is the cleanup project that we just opened. So let's accept the task. And uh, this is, as you remember, this is the business approval uh, step. So uh, we're approving this uh, operation of uh, removing the rules. I can choose here whether I want to approve it or reject it. So I choose uh, 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 approve and hit the done. The last stage is the technical uh, design and the implementation. So let's pick up the rules again. Again, it could be different handlers of the ticket, different, different uh, personas. Uh, we assume that at this stage it gets to the firewall admin uh, to um, remove the rule, whether manually or automatically, but with Tufin you can do it directly from Tufin. So I'm accepting the rule, or accepting the, the ticket, sorry. And then I want to, you know, after I get the business approval, I want to disable this rule. 
So I hit design. Our designer uh, tool is in progress, designing the uh, change onto the firewall, onto the checkpoint R80 in this case. And we can see here that we're going to disable rule number 10 and rule number 12. You can see the rule uh, from here before you operate, before you push the change. You can see the entire policy from here to better understand the context of the rule and where it resides. And then after understanding it, you can simply hit the update button Close this one. Okay. Let's close this one. Hit the update button and let you fin do the you no know, the heavy lifting for you and disabling the rules uh, from the device directly from Tufin. So yes, uh, we're done. We see the designer was pushing these two operations, disabling rule number 10 and 12. Let's close it. If we will go back to our uh, secure track product, go to compare, look for this particular firewall, look for the revision or wait for the revision to come. Compare the last two revisions. I don't see uh, the revision hasn't arrived yet. So I see here that there, these tickets are still uh, in process. It happens as we speak. Yep, here the revision arrived. We see a new revision uh, from now. Let's pick the two last revision and see what changed in them. And when comparing the two revisions for the CMA R80, we can see here, if we go down, that rule number eight and rule number 10 has been disabled. So this is the before, and this is, sorry, rule number 10 and rule number 12 were be disabled. You see here the before and the after. So again, let's get back to the slide deck and conclude what we have just seen. Uh, we identify uh, the different rules using our uh, designated tool that helps you to narrow down uh, uh, to the exact criteria that you are searching for. We open the ticket. Uh, we gain in-depth insight into the rule metadata and help the decision makers to have a decent decision based on the data on the rule. And we push the button and uh, remove the actual rule. And everything, all this process of removing the rule is being fully documented and ready for audit. So when audit comes and you know, ask why a certain rule or when this certain rule was disabled and why, everything is being documented. These two pieces of the process of identifying the, the isolated rules and having the assessments throughout the process is unique to Tufin. Let's move on to the second use case, server decommission. Joe, All right. on so, to you. All right. So uh, thanks for that demo. Definitely uh, a time savings from, from what I described in, in the previous use case. So if we move on to server decommissioning, that is the idea that we want to uh, remove a server from a firewall's policy, it's very similar uh, to rule decommissioning, but there's actually a, a couple other layers that are added on top of this process. The first one would be network objects, right? Where um, is this server represented in terms of network objects? Is it in a nested group? Is it referred to by name and IP? Um, that is a lot of, of search effort there. And then we start to dip a little bit into process as well, getting outside of the technology aspect. 
we have to figure out um, what the server is, uh, where it's located, what other access it may be responsible for. Does it have some type of dependencies? And then ideally, you know, we also want to get sign off uh, or business approval from the actual server owner so that when we do the decommissioning, there's no surprises and so on. Now, how would I do server decommissioning without Tufin? So the first thing, again, like in the rule decommissioning section, we're going to fire up uh, all of our management consoles. Um, and maybe we don't even have management consoles. Maybe we have some routers and things in the way uh, as well. So now we've got a whole screen of, of management consoles that we need to search for or, or search through. Um, and again, not all management consoles are going to have very useful uh, network object searches and so forth. You may have to resort uh, to your own tools. Uh, you may have to consult a change management database as well. And then after that, we need to figure out, um, once we've identified the server and its uh, different aliases, we have to find where is this server used in policies itself, and then can we get rid of those policies? Uh, how many policies am I now having to search through and modify as well? And then additionally, uh, which is something you know, in modern networks where firewalls are doing more than just letting packets come and go, um, they're actually doing advanced routing and VPN and so forth. And it's interesting that a server, uh, a server one right next to each other, uh, could take a different path. That is, you know, the firewall may decide with, you know, policy-based routing or, or natting and so forth, uh, that it's going to take a different path. And how do we determine that path, right? Because in this case, you're going to have to go to the server, uh, potentially do a tracer route, which is not... Uh, very accurate, or you're going to have to go and consult documentation, which is rarely up to date. Um, so it's a really, you know, it's a really aggravating problem because it's uh, what seems like a very simple task of removing a server, um, hopefully improving your security by doing so. Um, turns out it's very labor intensive. Okay, so labor intensive it is. Let's try to do it with different and see how easy it is. Um, so this time a demo for server uh, decommission. Uh, let's go back to our orchestration suite. Uh, let's close this uh, um, screens. And uh, we've prepared before on the server. Let's just copy and paste it. So it'll be easier to uh, remember. Okay. So using Tufin, uh, it's Pretty very easy to identify what would be, you know, first to have a standardized process to uh, manage your server decommission request. We know it's a challenge, uh, you know, server decommission or uh, idling servers that you get uh, an alert on happens every second Monday. Uh, we have engaged with you know, our cust different customers of ours. It can happen 40, 10, sometimes 100 times, and something even more than that uh, a month. And as Joe described, uh, it, it resides with some serious challenges to identify what would be the impact. Using Tufin, uh, you can do it very simple. Uh, and again, making sure your entire process is being documented and auditable. This is critical. You have a standardized process for server decommission. So we set up a simple workflow for server decommission with, again, three or four uh, uh, steps. Here, again, you can you know, customize this workflow to whatever your organization needs. Moreover, you can choose the level of automation, meaning you can automate one step or the other, but we'll touch it later on. Uh, and we set up four steps for server decommission. First, uh, who anyone who opens a, you know, a decommission request can opt in a server or servers or, sent or several servers and have a uh, request to decommission it. Then you have the business approval. Then you have the decommission analysis uh, that validates or uh, making uh, an impact analysis, uh, looking for all the places that the certain server that opt to decommission resides in, what rules, what object containing this uh, server. And you can you know, provision the change uh, using the commands that we will give you uh, directly to the devices. Again, very easy. Uh, very standardized and organized and without losing your head. So let's just do a demo for that. 
uh, let's just open a new request directly from Secure Change, with the automate, which is the automation system of Tufin. Uh, this time, server decommission request. And this is part of our cloud migration project. And we want to remove or decommission this server from our network. Uh, this is the command. You can set a due date. Again, you can decide what you want to put here as part of the requester's uh, uh, needs. Choose a due date. It will help to the SLA and submit a request. Once I submitted the request, again, I'm the requester and also the handler for the sake of this demonstration. I take this task for business approval, accept the request, approve it. You can choose to the granularity whether you have to have a reason or not. In this case, I've made it mandatory to have a reason. Hit the Done button. We're moving on to step number three. Step number three becoming the most interesting part because now I am going to analyze where this particular server resides within all of my network. So let's select a tool, which is the impact analysis. Let it make the job, and here it is. This server appears in all of these firewalls within of all of my network. It appears in ASA, in you know, my checkpoints SMC, some Palo Altos, and some SRXs. These servers appear in each and every policy of these ones. You can, you know, export this uh, to to a report or so, uh, or you can choose to complete the task directly from Tufin. So let's get back to the ticket, and then let's have our designer tool to help us to move it from the devices. In this case, with CLI commands. So if you go to the Cisco assets, for instance and hit the command button, you can see here all the commands that you can simply copy directly from Tufin, put on your uh, Cisco Access devices. This particular one is ASAV, you know, uh, and that's it. All the ser this server will be removed from all the particular groups and rules from your firewall. As easy as that, as easy as that. Let's get back to the ticket and search number four because we haven't really make it uh, for the sake of the uh, demonstration. You can verify that uh, you actually removed uh, these servers by a designated uh, verifier tool. So if you click here, done, and move to the fourth step. you will have a verifier tool that you know help you to verify whether the change happened or not. In this case, it, it hasn't because uh, we, haven't, we haven't pushed the change. But in case you are, then you will be easily be able to see what worked and what not. So let's get back to the presentation and summarize what we've just seen. We run an impact analysis in order to understand where this server uh, is used in our different policies across our all network, not just for a specific firewall, but for our entire network. We automated the design uh, to decommission all the server usage. We automated the provisioning with CLI commands for Cisco ASA and also for, uh, available for Juniper SRX. And all of this process, again, is being audited, is being documented and help your auditors to have a better insight into you know, internal processes. And um, you know, I'm sure this is something that not happens today uh, on a regular basis. All of these are unique for Tufin, uh, the server decommission uh, workflow and, and capability. So uh, we urge you to go into our website, uh, reach out to uh, your respective uh, Tufin representatives, 
and ask about it and how you can do it today with Secure Change. Joe, on to you to the third and last uh, use case. All right. Uh, very important, you know, mention about the running documentation and auditing because it's going to play uh, a big part in access commissioning. And I think what's really unique about access commissioning is kind of the the, the perfect storm of, of people, process, and technology uh, that's involved in the process of commissioning access, right? So from the technology standpoint, uh, we have to figure out again uh, which devices are along this communication path, right? How uh, do I find these devices? How do I modify the rule sets and so forth? Um, and then, you know, where do I add this access to the policy? Um, you know, to make sure that we're not adding, uh, you know, security violations or um, just simply putting in a shadowed rule for, for fun and profit. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have the, the vendor itself, right? So different vendors have different uh, firewall uh, methodology or policy methodologies now. And you want to make sure that your access is done uh, in the most proper way possible. Now, Additionally, you know, you have uh, kind of this maze that you need to run through when you want to do uh, access commissioning because the people and process that's involved, right? So uh, people are desiring to get access out or in, depending on uh, the request. But then you also have this whole process uh, part on top of it, right? Um, does the requester have the right to even request this access? Uh, is the access within uh, compliant policies? And so forth. Um, just a big, uh, just a big maze. And and larger, you know, corporations or enterprises, um, this really gets uh, out of hand uh, sometimes. And then additionally, you also in in networks have tools that are acting upon traffic outside of the firewalls, right? For example, like an intrusion prevention system, um, and that may be blocking uh, someone's access or part of someone's access. And it's important that you're able to verify and show that the firewalls are allowing traffic to go forth uh, and so on. And so how would we do this today without Tufin? So right now, it's a very, it's a very labor intensive process, right? Because we have, we have these technology issues at hand uh, about adding the rule and so forth. Um, how do we add that rule in an optimized way? Maybe I want to use pre or post rules in, in Panorama, or I have rules being inherited from an administrative domain in Fortinet or similar. Um, and then maybe we're going out to the cloud and the access uh, uh, methodology is completely different, you know, something like security groups in Amazon. Um, and now, you know, we need to have uh, vendor SMEs uh, for a whole change across the path, uh, which is very difficult for an organization to sustain. Now, you also have the people and process aspect, right? And this is where those workflows uh, from Tufin really come in handy so that we have an audit process where we know why this access was requested. Um, we know that it's not going to violate compliance. And, and, how, and that's an interesting question of its own. How do you know what the uh, compliance stance of your organization is? Do you have it written down in some document? Uh, do you have it searchable by IP and so forth? Um, and then, you know, we start opening up uh, traffic between different zones or cloud providers and so forth. Um, it becomes a very difficult compliance problem. And so, very curious, how do we do this with Tufin? How do we do the workflow management uh, around access commissioning to make this easier for the practitioner? Okay. So, um, this is, again, the, uh, a very interesting use very case. Uh, Maybe uh, one of the first ones seen as address uh, uh, as part of exchange uh, mechanism. So with Tufin's the end-to-end -end access commissioning automation, uh, you can increase agility and security. Uh, Tufin provides the automation at every step of the change process, as well automation for the process for flow itself. Um, network security change requests can originate uh, from different application connectivity models using our secure app uh, 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 product, uh, which you could, again, log into our website, uh, read about it, and, and reach out to uh, your uh, respective uh, Tiffin representative in your area. It could be originated from a third-party ticketing system like Remedy or ServiceNow uh, or HP Service Manager or so forth, anything that connects with API 
we allow our APIs and everything can be uh, connected to GFIN, or directly from our customer user portal, as you saw in the demo uh, when we open a ticket for directly from GFIN. So these are the options that you could uh, originate a ticket request for access commissioning from. And then, uh, as part of the uh, uh, automated risk assessment that you can, you know, uh, deploy right at the beginning of uh, any access request, we will ensure that the security and compliance, together with the agility, we will provide you an automated risk analysis. Uh, each network security change request is proactively examined exa against our central security policy baseline to identify the address and address uh, any potential violation. So for that matter, you can see here our unified security policy, again, unique to TUFIN, uh, where we, here you can define the different connectivity uh, uh, mechanisms between your different security zones. So for instance, you can see that from P data center uh, to Amsterdam site B, you have a green uh, indication, meaning the connectivity is allowed, but with some exceptions that you can, again, uh, define with the TUFIN, and whenever an access request uh, spanning out between these two uh, areas, you will be, the change request will be vetted against this matrix and let you know whether a certain access request is violating any compliance and what exactly it's being compliant. It helps you to risk assessment, it helps you to audit, it helps you to, con it helps you to contain the risk that may pause between two access requests. Uh, once the security and compliance are cleared and approved, the change can be automatically designed to provide a clear and accurate implementation uh, plan. Uh, TUFIN delivers a trusted design based on accurate topology simulation and path analysis across heterogeneous platforms and topology architecture. So how it's done today with TUFIN we will first automatically select the target policy in the policy path of the requested change. We will then identify the targets that require change in the policy to allow the request access. And only then we will help you with designing the optimal policy change for the specific targets. And you know, for instance, we will give you the most uh, uh, efficient and secured rules that you need either to change or to add as part of each and every firewall. And it's again, vendor agnostics, whether it's you know, your uh, brand new Checkpoint R80 device, or it's your Panorama, or Fortinet, or uh, even you know, AWS security groups, we will help you with picking up the right targets as part of your route, and help you with the exact change that should be happening in your firewall and your security groups. Then, uh, again, this is why when using TUFIN, it's very flexible. You can choose the level of automation from either fully manual workflow, you can move on to a semi-automated workflow with just having the design happen in TUFIN and then the provisioning itself, the actual change you can you know, choose to do manually, or you can go for the full-blown of zero-touch automation and have the change happen directly from TUFIN. Uh, so Tufin provides an automated provisioning for leading firewalls and next generation firewalls platforms, uh, such as Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Panorama, Fortinet, Fortinet Manager, uh, Cisco, Juniper, and also Forcepoint, uh, which is the new brand for StoneSoft uh, next generation firewalls. And as I mentioned, on top of that, Tufin is the only vendor who supports end-to-end -end change automation lifecycle management including full provisioning within heterogeneous and hybrid cloud, including the AWS security groups uh, change automation. Lastly, uh, Tufin provides every aspect of the ensuring compliance and audit readiness with one, real-time change monitoring and accountability, two, automatic audit trail, three, automatic change verification and authorization against the approved change request, for uh, a complete history of each change request. And of course, on top of that, you can easily issue reports and have uh, you know, different KPIs to measure your improvement uh, of these kind of processes. Um, no last word about the provisioning piece. Uh, you can see all of these vendors and the automated provisioning piece. Uh, all of these vendors are, can be automatically 
provisioned directly from Tiffin. Uh, whether it's Checkpoint R80, which is unique to Tiffin, Amazon uh, security groups, you can actually design rules and security groups uh, changes and push it directly from Tufin. Panorama and Forty Manager uh, are also uniquely to Tufin in term in the forms of uh, we foresee the you know, the device groups in Panorama and the ADOMs in Forty Manager and able to understand them and push the changes best on these uh, uh, vendors. Palo Alto and Fortinet uh, best practices. And lastly, fourth point, fourth point, which is again the next generation firewall for uh, StoneSoft. All right, so let's uh, let's sum this up so we can get to some of the questions from the audience. So ideally, that you know you've taken from this presentation how automation can save you time, especially on the mundane task, uh, because we we at Tufin want to turn everybody uh, into an automation ninja so that they can go off and do and tackle. Uh, bigger problems. And then additionally, always remember that uh, when you're doing automation with Tufin, you have uh, an audit trail, you have documentation built in. Uh, I know uh, some of you may, may empathize with me where I'm not a big fan of documentation and having a tool coming right behind you doing all that is highly valuable. All right, so let's get to some of these questions that uh, the audience has proffered in the last two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, obviously we have more than 200 participants in this uh, webinar. We have many questions. We won't be able to attend them all. So let's pick like the first ones that that's picked up. And uh, those of you who didn't get an answer, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll provide you all our contacts, and uh, uh, um, you know we're happy to answer these. So the first question is about the rule decommission. Uh, uh, someone else is asking, is uh, this is this feature only possible for checkpoints? Uh, and whether other firewalls like Palo Alto is also uh, applicable. So definitely yes, and this is the power of, of you know, tools like Tufin. Uh, we're vendor agnostic. You can you know, decommission, uh, use rule decommission for uh, various kinds of, of firewalls and platforms. Uh, we just see the demo for Checkpoint already, but it's also relevant for Panorama, Forty Manager, uh, Cisco, ASA, and so forth. So definitely yes. Uh, and uh, another question uh, is, what is the best practice to document more than one request and thus requested uh, that results in identical rules? Uh, multiple rules will, would be one way, but the contradicts the shadow rule cleanup. So again, using Tufin and its workflow mechanism, Whenever we, whenever you know, a requester is opting a rule for decommissioning, uh, and the you know the flow starts and the the rule or the rules are in in part of the process, you will see a quick indication uh, within the product that, and you can see it here right here on my screen. You can see in the pro a product an indication that a certain rule is undergoing a treatment already, and you won't be able to open another request for this particular rule. So let's go for the, you know, the question that we just, uh, the query that we just did. Uh, if we go to rule number six, for instance, you see the ticket sign here. This rule is already part of ticket ID 141. And uh, if it's already in a certain process or so, you won't be able to activate a change, another change on it. So the answer is yes, you can do it with Tiffin um, very easily. This is why the management console is orchestrating with uh, the other product which is to secure change. So again, we're wrapping up, up here because we uh, reached out to the end of the hour. Uh, the Bright Talk uh, platform uh, only, only allows us 60 minutes. So we want to thank you all for all of your questions, for all of your attendees. Uh, I'm Eris Moore. Uh, you have my LinkedIn information. Joe Schreiber, thank you very much for uh, uh, co-presenting with us uh, in this presentation. You have a Twitter account. And again, uh, good luck with your cleanups, your change automation request, and you know, have a nice day. Bye, everyone.